Well, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate all of those wonderful words. And uh, mostly I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you again. It's always such a joy. What a tremendous congregation you have. Uh, your testimony in the community, your leadership, um, what a blessing you are to the body of Christ. We're so grateful to be able to have fellowship with you in this way. And I know that Mark and Jeff and I are all honored to be here again with our families and, and uh, their family. And we just, we just appreciate so much being able to be here. <clears throat> I'm not used to preaching 30-minute sermons. Uh, Jeff said I was deep. I think it just takes longer to get the tap down into whatever I've got each week. But uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I do want to thank in advance Mark and Jeff each for giving me 15 minutes of their time so that I can... <clears throat> So that I can be more comfortable, and that being the first speaker, I kind of have leverage here. So, uh, <laughs> if you'll turn in your Bibles to uh, Daniel chapter three, uh, we're going to talk about the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, to kind of illustrate our point today. Uh, we'll get to the text a little bit later. Let's open in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for the assembly of your saints and for the purpose of the church and that you've promised to be here with us and to be among us. Um, and so we recognize that your presence is here. We ask you to fill us all with your spirit, to anoint us to both speak and to hear, Lord, and that the word that comes forth today, whether through praise, worship, prayer, Lord, would be effectual in our souls and cause us to be more and more like you each day, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> when I was in high school, uh, probably a freshman or sophomore, our pastor left our church and we received a new pastor. And uh, on his first Sunday with us, he asked if he could meet with the youth, the, the high school class, the high school group. There were quite a few of us. Um, and he met, shared some thoughts, and then he asked us, he said, do you have any questions for me as your new pastor? Um, and uh, <clears throat> I'll never forget one of our seniors spoke up and he asked a question. <clears throat> he said, Pastor, um, he said, I would like to know um, when I'm out on a date with my girlfriend, and we're all snuggled up in the back seat and we're kissing and, and doing that. Um, how, how intimate can we, can we be? How, how far can we go? And still, still be Christians. And I'll never forget watching the reaction on his face. The disappointment in his eyes as he turned and I'm sure reflected in his soul and realized maybe the source of the question and he kind of chippered up because he knew he needed to be godly and he said, you know, he says, really, you're asking the, the wrong question. He says, that's, that's not the question that you should be asking. He said, he said what if you were to ask me this question? He said, when I'm out on a date with my girlfriend, how can I preserve her dignity? How can I preserve this, this young lady that I'm with, maybe if my future wife, how can I preserve her honor, her virginity? How can I preserve that? How can I show her that my life's purpose is to live for Christ? How can I show her that? You know, I've never forgotten that. that. I've meditated on that through the years, and thinking about that led me to another concept, another thought. <clears throat> I want to talk to you today about convictions, holding convictions, Christian convictions. I'm not talking about the kind of convictions that Dr. Click has, you know, uh, courtroom convictions, um, you know. I, I, I'm talking about having personal convictions, you know. Um, so before I go any further, um, let me just ask the question, what, what is a conviction? What is a personal conviction? conviction as Christians. In Christian parlance, when I say, I, I have a conviction about this, what is that? So the idea of a conviction is to have a strong belief, but, but really in our lives, we need strong beliefs that drive us to action, 
We need strong beliefs that, that drive us to thinking like the pastor was thinking when he talked to that high school student, that we need to be thinking above what is the minimum of what we can get by with in our Christian life. We need to establish convictions that allow us to live a life that shows Jesus in our day-to-day -day life. Um, and uh, what, what that story had caused me to discover as I thought about convictions is that there are certain what I call bridge activities that in and of themselves are not sinful. But we discover in our life as we continually participate in those activities that more times than not, when we engage in this, we do fall into sin. Can everyone relate to me uh, uh, on this? We might discover that kind of sin in, in dating. We might discover that kind of sin in, in uh, maybe uh, uh, surfing the internet without a net nanny or some, something. We might, there are a lot of, just let your imagination go, there are a lot of kinds of activities, maybe the people we run around with. There are a lot of bridge activities that we do that in and of themselves are not sin, but we find that we rarely act, uh, enter into that activity without falling into some kind of sin. Now, let me ask this question. If we're going to engage in an activity that we know is going to more than likely lead us to sin, what about that activity? You know, whatsoever we do, whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, we want to do to the glory of God. And if I, if I, I I'm not trying to be legalistic here. I, I, I promise you, my goal is not to, to put anyone under condemnation. But the scriptures show us over and over the wonderful joy that we can find in being people who establish convictions and live above the day-to-day -day temptations of life. It's not about the law. It's not about establishing rules for ourselves and then imposing those rules on other people or establishing rules for ourselves and then being prideful that we're able to keep them. The goal is to let the light and the life of Jesus shine through our lives because our lives are a contrast to the darkness of the world around us. And God is going to use our convictions maybe more than anything else. Maybe more than us preaching the gospel on a soapbox on a street corner. He's going to use our convictions as we engage with the people of the world around us more than anything else to show the life and light of his word to a dying world. And if we're people who don't have many convictions then maybe our light is not shining very brightly. Uh, <clears throat> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had convictions. Now, we know the story. Uh, three men with Daniel, four at least, uh, that had been brought from Jerusalem. And they were commanded, basically, to uh, fall down and worship an idol. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar had, had commanded all of his leaders in his administration uh, to come out to the plains of Duma, and there was a 90-foot idol out there, probably an idol of Nebuchadnezzar himself, um, and 90-foot idol out there, and they had uh, brought the musicians, and the command was that when you hear you know, the horn and the pipe and the lyre and the tragon and the the bagpipe, apparently they had some Brits there too, um, and, and the harp, and, and every kind of music, when, when you hear this, then you must bow down. And so everybody was assembled, and Nebuchadnezzar, no doubt, says, okay, and they sounded the music, and everybody bowed, except Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And by the way, I can guarantee you, Daniel was not there that day. How do I know? You think he would have bowed? No, he wouldn't have been. So I don't know where he was, maybe away on business. You know, maybe he called in sick. Good time to call in sick. <clears throat> but here they are. They refused to bow down. Some Chaldeans grab them, bring them before Nebuchadnezzar. 
And Nebuchadnezzar's furious, but he likes these guys. Um, and you can tell by the way the story goes, other places, and, and even his countenance changed. Just the way the text reads. You know he wants to give them a chance. Most people, he probably just grab them and say, I'm done with you. You're toast, literally. But in this case, you know, he says, um, I'm going to give you another chance. And so he says, when you hear the music, bow down. They said, wait a minute. You, you don't even need to play it. We, we, there's no reason. We, we don't need to answer you on this. We're not going to debate this. I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but we're, we're just not going to do it. We're not, we're not going to bow. You don't need to play the music anymore. Um, you know, we're, we're not going to bow. And he said, well, there's no God that can save you. And they said, well, yeah, wow. actually, actually there is. Our God will save us. Um, but we're not God, and even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow. We have a conviction. We have a conviction. And we're not going to bow regardless of the consequences. This is a conviction. When you have something that you believe and you say, you know what, this is something I'm, I'm going to live the Christian life and this is something that I'm, I'm going to do and, and nine times out of ten I'm going to live this way. Nine times out of ten I'm going to make this decision. Nine times out of ten I'm going to do this usually but, but, but not necessarily always and if the consequences are too bad I would, I would change that. Well, that's a preference and, and that's okay to have, those, have preferences but there are certain things that we should have convictions about. There are certain things that we should have convictions about. And if we know of an activity that always leads us to sin, it might be time for us to stop and say, you know what, I'm going to stop engaging in this kind of activity because I'm fooling myself to pretend that I'm going to walk onto this bridge and not go over to the other side. And I'm going to cut this out of my life. And I'm just going to say from today on... I'm not doing this anymore. It's just not going to be part of my life because it compromises my testimony before my wife, before my children, before the world, before my workmates, before the other people of the church. It compromises my walk with God. I'm not going to do it. And I'm going to establish a conviction. And I further want to encourage you to establish convictions to, as a family. You may have a conviction. Your wife may have convictions um, but but don't, don't raise your children with the idea that everybody can establish their own convictions. You need, and, and forgive me for being so dogmatic about this, but as leaders, as fathers and mothers, as parents of, of uh, homes who are given, charged with the responsibility of raising kids to follow Jesus, in this world today that is trying to pervert their values, and will lie to them at the drop of a hat, will steal their morality from them at the earliest possible age. You need to establish some convictions and cause your children to be raised with those convictions and see the value of it. Because I'm of the inclination that one of the reasons why we as believers feel like we don't ever see God move in our life is because there's nothing for God to do. We read in about, about David. He's being pursued by Saul. He could have probably killed Saul in self-defense. I mean, he had the chance, but he refused to touch God's anointed. And it was a faith thing he did. I'm not going to kill the king that God's put into place. I have a conviction about killing the king that God's put into place here. Um, and God honored him for that. Joseph refused to touch Potiphar's wife. And God honored him for that. Abraham went to the mountain to sacrifice his son at complete despair, no doubt. But confident that God was able to rescue him, and, and he did. And Joseph, uh, or Joshua and Caleb, standing there, getting ready to get stoned because ten spies said we shouldn't go into the kingdom. And these two guys said, we need to go in. And the people were so convicted right. by their faith. The people were humiliated by the faith of Joshua and Caleb. They were so embarrassed they were going to murder these two men because they had faith. But they would not be moved. And God took those two out of 600,000 soldiers, two above the age of 20, went in. Your calculator probably doesn't have enough zeros to tell you what the percentage 
of that is. If you have a little pocket calculator, that, that's, that's a small percentage of people that went into the land of Canaan. Two. The two that wouldn't bend. The two that had a conviction that we're going to do what God tells us to do. And so we've got to have these convictions in our life. And we need to build convictions as families. We have some convictions in our home that we've had since our kids were little. And it has been around the convictions that we've had that our family has been often challenged. But if you ask our kids if there's a God, they have no doubt. Because they have seen God's hand move in our life to rescue us when our convictions have caused us to be in a tight spot. Now, what's caused us to be in a tight spot? Our convictions? No, because the Bible was written a long time before our convictions were formed. Uh, is it the devil that caused us? Yes, he's after us. There's no doubt. What's he wanting us to do? He's wanting us to compromise our convictions. But it's also God's sovereignty. Because when you establish convictions, you'll find that God often challenges you at that very point of conviction. And the reason he does it is so that when you find yourself in the fire, he can join you there. What happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They got thrown into the, excuse me, thrown into the fire. Well, who joined them there? One like the Son of God? One of the ways that my love, my passion, my belief, my faith in Christ has grown has been that, that I have watched God allow me to be put into difficult circumstances based around the convictions that I have. And he has rescued me. Now, please don't get me wrong. Um, when we say rescued, it doesn't always mean that we come out the way that we want to. You know, it doesn't mean, like in Facing the Giants, that we're going to win the football game necessarily. You know, it doesn't mean, like in Fireproof, that, that if we're struggling in our marriage, that our marriage is always going to just work out and turn out to be wonderful. Um, it doesn't mean that if I stand with my convictions in philosophy class, that the professor is going to die in a car wreck but get saved in the process. But it does mean that you will be rewarded. You cannot, can not stand by a biblical conviction without being rewarded. You can't. And let me ask you the converse. Can anyone give me an example of one time in their life that they have sinned and been better off for it. And you might be able to tell me that you sinned and you didn't get punished. And your equivalency is here that not getting punished is being better off than being punished. I don't think that's God's perspective. So if you have to lie to stay from being, keep from being punished, if you have to cheat, if you have to deceive, or if you're having financial issues and you steal something and you say, yeah, I took this, it wasn't mine, but it saved me bankruptcy or it saved me something else, then you're totally misunderstanding the entire operation of the kingdom of God. You're totally misunderstanding it. And you're having the idea that, that chastening or that not getting what you want is the whole goal of the Christian life or somehow what the Bible teaches that if we'll do this, then God's going to always do this. God's not a God that jumps through our hoops. And when he tells us that something is sin or if we know in our heart that something is the wrong thing to do, if we do that, we always lose 100% of the time. We lose. Our goal is to become like Christ. Each time I sin and fail and compromise and do that, I'm taking a step back from Christ-likeness. I'm not moving forward. Much better it is to be honest and take the consequences for whatever you did. 
Much better it is to not take something that isn't yours and face the financial issue that's, that's ahead that's being caused. Because God will be in the midst of that, even if you sin once you repent, God will be in the midst of that for restoration and growth and continued progress. And you'll look back on that seasons later and say, look what God did in my humility and my repentance and my integrity, God restored but you cannot sin and be better off. And you cannot stand by a biblical conviction without growing in Christ. And that's the goal. That's the whole purpose of Christianity. To grow in Christ. Why? Two reasons. One is so that Christ would be seen in our life by those who don't know him and even by those who do, that we're responsible for, our brothers. As everyone grows in Christ, the, uh, uh, the rising lock takes all the boats up. So that, that's one. The other reason is because our eternal reward depends upon our becoming like Christ. And so there's a purpose in all of this. We're down here, and we're, we're looking at all the circumstances and we're making these decisions and we're living down here in the mully grubs of our life and trying to decide what to do and, and all of this stuff. And God is up here and he's trying. He's given you, a, uh, not a formula, but he's giving you his word and his lamp, his light, his word is a lamp to your feet telling you how to walk because he knows the path to Christ's likeness. He knows the path to being like Jesus. He knows the path to eternal joy and did you know we can experience a great big piece of eternal joy in this life? In this life. We can experience huge joy in this life if we're walking with him. But if we're not walking with him, we are the most miserable of creatures. I'm, I'm totally convinced the most miserable people on the planet are Christians who are constantly violating their conscience and not walking in repentance. I think they are, they are the most miserable people on the planet, more miserable than the lost. The lost are walking in unity with the, the purpose of, of the kingdom of darkness, which is live for yourself. But we're walking in, in contradiction when we live in a life that is without, uh, without convictions. So these men... Uh, and we'll, let's go ahead and go to Daniel 3.28. These men are in the fire, and, and there's a fourth man there, a divine presence with them. And Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angels and delivered his servants who trusted in him, and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own. He's having a change of mind here. Why? Because of their convictions. This would have never happened had they bowed. So here's the king of all of the known world to them is having an encounter with the God of creation. Verse 29. Therefore I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb. Their house shall be laid in ruin, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Then he wrote a letter throughout his whole kingdom, the next two verses here. King Nebuchadnezzar said to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. Nebuchadnezzar knew he was encountering a God greater than himself. This would have never happened had not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego been willing to risk their life to never change a conviction that they had probably held since they were raised in Judah before the captivity by mom and dad in the tribe of Judah in Jerusalem where they were learning the Ten Commandments, little children. What's the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's right, Mark. And what's the second one? Thou shalt not make unto thyself any Nebuchadnezzars. Right? Any graven images. First two things these guys probably learned in their life. 
And here they are. It follows them all the way and to the point where if you read the rest of this book, you'll find Nebuchadnezzar has even more glowing words for God later. Hallelujah. For our God. Yeah. This, this prideful, arrogant, deceived demagogue has an encounter with God because of the convictions of three men who are willing to waste their life on being obedient to God. Lord, thank you for your goodness that even when it seems like we're not getting what we want, Lord, that you have laid out a pattern, a, a pathway of life for us in this word. Would you help us to, to walk um, in, in this word? Would you help us to identify areas in our life that lead to our failure? Would you help us to identify the bridges in our life that, that take us from godliness to ungodliness, where we seem to lose our will and our inability to stand? Would you give us grace to not make room for the devil? Would you give us grace, Lord, to renew our mind and to set our affections on things above, to count all things as loss for the glory of your kingdom, for the joy of the fellowship of suffering with you as we deny ourselves and choose, Lord, to let eternal things rule and reign and dominate our souls and our lives, Lord, for the joy and the glory of your kingdom so that we can pass the truth and the life and the purpose of your kingdom on to others and down to our children for generations. Thank you for the gift of this word, Lord. Let this word rule us, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.